If you can look at somebody like Rick as the businessman run amok, that you know he's not an immoral thug, he's he's more of an amoral capitalist. As an, he's an opportunist, and and there's a great American tradition of amoral uh, opportunists. That um, the the chance for redemption uh, becomes higher. In summer of 1994, LA Times flies me out to Tyler, Texas. I'm at the Smith County Jail, and Rick walks out of the gates, a free man. I'll never forget my first glimpse of him. He's maybe 5'7". I think he was weighing about 145 pounds at the time. I mean, for somebody who had cast such a large shadow, you're not seeing where that shadow is. He took me to his boyhood home, which was an abandoned shack. I mean, it was, it was literally boarded up, and it was in this kind of meadow overgrown by weeds. I'm sitting in this cell, and then I'm going back over my life. I'm looking at my kids. If I don't have nothing, you know, I need to be with my kids, man. They need me. Then, you know, I never had time for them. So when our kids really don't know me right now, you know, almost like my daddy did me. I can just imagine what they went through when they was in the park. It's like being in jail. Everybody looks. Just think about all my friends. Got all in jail in India. I was in jail in Texas County with 20 years, man. He ain't never been coming home. Got never with Phoenix for 30 years, Cliff with 20. Cliff ain't know nothing about no drugs. He had never seen cocaine before. I showed it to him. Either somebody kill you or they put you in jail for the rest of your life. Just got to change, man. We're in Miami today, and it's the first time that we're going to be able to question Mr. Roberts under oath about how he acquired the name Rick Ross. And I want to see that if he lied to me in front of me. So it's going to be interesting for me today, too. What is the definition of a commercial CD to you? Something that's uh, being sold retail. He wouldn't shake my hand. He never acknowledged that I was in the room. And I think in the end that, you know, everybody's gonna find out that he really did take my name and that he's really a fraud. It's not a 3-5 Ken A Classic one and Trey on this Sunday morning. Trey was cracking. What's up with you, brother? We got a document that we went downtown Exclusive and got. Exclusive document. Exclusive right. document. No, nobody has this. Here's the question to Rick Ross, the rapper. How did you decide to use Rick Ross as your professional name? And this is his response, tattoo. Well, playing football in high school, we all wanted to go to University of Miami. They played in the Big East Conference. That was my first nickname. Everybody that was on our offensive line, we all called each other Big East. Oh. When I became All-American, by the time I was a sophomore, I was Big Boss, the biggest boss. That was my nickname. And from there, when I graduated high school, a friend really mistaken it as Rick Ross at one time, the Big Boss. When he brought it up to me, it became my moniker. It had no meaning to you other than some guy just accidentally thought your name was Rick Ross. It had no meaning to the other that some guy just accidentally thought, oh, my, my, my bad, none, none. <laughs> Gonna be clean up Los Angeles, really clean up Los Angeles. What's up, young Dale? What's up, boy? You didn't recognize me, huh? A mutual friend, used to deal with Rick. Like, chick, you know, Rick want to talk to you. I think y'all should hook up. He think about starting a youth center and stuff like that. Because I was already, you know, leaning towards starting my youth center. 
And so Rick had the building, which was perfect match. So he's like, oh, OK, this is perfect. Long, Ricky was so <laughs> sincere. I mean, I, I remember how excited he was. He was meeting people in the community. We might be able to get some funds in here to help. Okay, <laughs> he was donating, you know, money to his mom's church and put up new backboards in the park. I was very impressed with where he was and where he was going starting even in-house at the LA Times, there was some consternation that I was romanticizing Freeway Rick, that I was buying into his bullshit. <laughs> they felt that there was no doubt that he was gonna go back to drug dealing. What else was he gonna do? I believe that I'm relentless. I believe that no matter what obstacles they put in front of me, I'm not going to let them stop me. I'm going to keep going. You knock me down, I'm going to get up. I ain't going to lay on the floor. If you kick me, I'm going to roll over and then get up. See, a lot of times with a lot of people, if they get hit, they lay down and they stop. They don't get up. But you got to get up. You can't stay there. Anything that's worth having is hard. Don't believe when people tell you that it's supposed to be easy. See, because the, the easiest dope deal I ever did, guess what happened to it? Can anybody guess what the easiest dope deal got me? In jail. In jail. The easiest dope deal I ever did sent me to prison. Because my partner, he called me. I ain't selling dope no more. I quit. My partner called me. He said, look, man. I'm stuck. I need your help. When Blandon got out, he knew only one thing, that pager number, and that was me. Blandon wanted to know where Rick was. He wanted to talk to him, you know, to see how he was doing, you know. And I was, I was cool with that. I was cool because, you know, this man took care of him. They took care of each other. And so um, I gave him Rick's mother's number to call Rick. Rick was there. It was my fault that Blandon got to Rick. I picked the phone up. I'm like, oh man, you know, I don't, I don't know nobody, man. Whoa, 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 whoa. Man, it ain't, it ain't like that. It ain't like that. So boom, I hang the phone up. Then me and Chico start talking. Man, what, what Blando? You know, what he want? He was telling me what Blando was. I'm like, man, and he's like, you got the money? I said, yeah, I got the money. You know, like, you know, what we gonna do? Like, you wanna do something? Like, well, if you give me this amount of money, I do this for you. And that's how the whole conversation opened about buying a hundred kilo. I'm talking about he's gonna give it to me for 10,000 a kilo. So she goes, what, 10,000 a kilo? I'm like, damn, man, that's a hell of a price, you know? So we talking about it, talking about it. That went on for months, this conversation. Like, I don't know, Blandon keep calling. Rick, like, Chick, he want us to come down there. You want to go down there? Do you want to meet him? We set up a deal and, um, you know, they had price points that they knew would trigger me. And they had the right person to do it. We pulled up at a Denny's. So I'm thinking we're going to get the things right there. Danilo's trying to get his money. Right? Give me the money. Give me the money. I'm telling him, you sure? I said, man, he's going to rob us. This is going to rob He's going to just take the money. So I'm like, hold up, Chico, man. Don't give him your money, man, until you see the dope. And I told him right in front of Danilo. I questioned Rick. I said, man, are you sure, man? That's my last thing to Rick. Are you sure? And he's like, no, nah, Chico, cool. He took it, three hundred thousand in the paper bag. Chico gave him the money, and boom. I see the guys putting their jackets on, like that's our FBI. Like, what the fuck? So I'm flying, and I look in my rearview mirror, and there's police chasing me. And I look up when I pass by, and Danilo is sitting on the side. He's like laughing at us, you know, like 
you know, like, and it was like sickening. Man. So, you know, I'm driving, I'm like, thinking that my life is over, man. Like, I'm, I want to be dead. You know, I done promised my kids, you know, I ain't getting back involved with drugs, you know, and I'm going to be around for them. You know, I done got back involved, you know, I done lied to them. When I found out that Rick had taken the bait, I was I was furious. I remember I remember saying, you know, what what a fucking idiot. And you know, I was talking about him and I was talking about myself. I was assigned to do investigative reportings, and so I concentrated on the war on drugs because I saw that as an issue that nobody was covering really. And I, I wanted to cover it like it was a real war. I had done a, another story on asset forfeitures. And I got a call from a woman in Oakland who said that uh, her boyfriend was in jail. And he had been in jail for three years. And he'd never been brought to trial. And he'd lost his house and lost his business and lost everything he owned. And, um, thought that I should do a story about it. And he says, and so a lot of people are charged with trafficking. I said, yeah, but unfortunately, they had been trafficking on behalf of the United States government. And at that point, I said, this woman's a nut. You know, she's crazy. <laughs> oh, the CIA? The CIA is probably involved. And I said, are you mocking me? She got a little offended, and she said, you know, I don't, how can you blow me off like that? You don't know me. You don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, and I can document what I'm telling you. And I said, OK, let me just put it to you this way. There's a hearing in a couple weeks down here in San Francisco. Worst thing is, you come down here. I'll bring the documents that I have. And you can look at them. And worst comes to worst, you have a day in San Francisco. You have a great lunch. It's better than Sacramento. I hear his dead silence for a few seconds. And I thought, I said, are you still there? And he says, well, you're right about that. And so I met her um, at the courthouse in San Francisco. I got the boxes out of my car, and he kind of looked through some of them. He's like, how did you get sealed grand jury transcripts? And I said, I can't tell you that. I can give them to you. That night, I got a phone call from him, and I think we talked for like six hours. She could prove what she was saying. And based on that lead, I started following up the story about this drug trafficker who had, during the 1980s, worked for this group called Contras and how he had sold cocaine in the United States and specifically in South Central Los Angeles to support this CIA operation down in Central America. I called my lawyer one day and he's like, this reporter contacted me. And he says that uh, he knows your guy. I said, oh, yeah. He said, yeah, he's, the guy wants to talk to you. So uh, I said, all right. So I call, and somebody said, oh, well, Gary's on a fishing trip. He'll be back in a couple of days. I'm like, on a fishing trip? I'm looking at a life sentence. <laughs> Get him on the farm, you know, because I'm still used to having my way. I remember very vividly Mr. Webb coming to me and telling me that there was much more to the story than I was aware of, and he basically ran down to me that Blandone was a government informant who was selling crack cocaine to Ricky Ross with the acquiescence and knowledge of the United States government, which was mind-boggling. So you were running the Los Angeles operation, isn't that correct? Yes. I remember we were running, yes. Whatever we were running in LA, it was the profit. It was going to the counter revolution. I felt mad. I was angry knowing that he was on my phone for months in jail himself. They let him out to just get rid. You know, it's hard to believe that that a friend would uh would do you like that. Somebody that that you feel is close and dear to your heart, you know, is uh, setting you up to go to jail for the rest of your life. That's like the utmost betrayal.
You don't write a story saying the CIA was involved in drugs based on one source. I ended up going all over the world and talking to people in Nicaragua and Costa Rica. And they were following me when I was down in Central America and they, and they told me about it. I mean, they were trying to intimidate me to get me off the story. Don't give me the conspiracy bullshit. Come on, you're, you're a more intelligent man than that. Well, uh, come on, come on. I mean, come on. Yeah, 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 this think... is, this is, there has never been a conspiracy in this country. The headline read that CIA has been supplying crack cocaine to the inner city gang members in South Central Los Angeles. Totally blew my mind. Man, I was sitting in prison, I was blown the fuck away. Danilo, Reagan, and all them, you know, flooding South Central with fucking cocaine. When it started getting out, the reaction from the public was pretty astonishing. I think it is enough information here to say to the CIA, you stand accused. Even if the government just turned a blind eye and didn't do anything about it, then you have to start questioning the whole system. You want to know why black people don't believe in the government? Because we know what the government is capable of. People were demanding some answers from the government because essentially what we were doing was accusing the U.S. government of, of being complicit in drug trafficking and not just any drug trafficking, the crack cocaine trafficking that was like the scourge of African-American communities across the United States. This was uh, something that, that got people pissed off. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk with members of this community about charges that the CIA introduced crack cocaine into South Central Los Angeles in the mid-1980s. You, you sit up here drinking your coffee, you know, and y'all killing babies, bro, with that bullshit. This is some bullshit, buddy. <laughs> CIA fights drugs. CIA does not encourage drugs. They used the contras to, to destabilize Nicaragua, and they used the crack that they brought back on those planes to destabilize South Central and destabilize the youth here. It's not a situation where the government or the CIA sat down and said, okay, let's invent crack, let's sell it in black neighborhoods, let's decimate black America. It's, it was a situation where we need money for a covert operation. The quickest way to raise it is to sell cocaine. You guys go sell it somewhere. We don't want to know anything about it. And you had this bad luck of them doing it right at the time people were figuring out how to make crack out of it. And they asked me to go, like, Chico, you need to be there. I'm like, all right, I'll go. I'm the person they talking about. Man, I stood up. OK, the gentleman in the navy blue jacket. I'm Chico. I'm Ricky Walsh, co-defendant. And you guys wrote a, you guys wrote a declaration to, our, to my judge saying it wasn't no involvement. How could you say there's no involvement if an investigation ain't over? Me and Ricky Ross is waiting to get sentenced Tuesday. And she got, what, what, what a judge going to say to us come Tuesday? Rick looking at life. My first offense, I'm looking at 20. And Blandone is out of jail, and you paid him $166,000. We don't have the boats, we don't got the planes to bring it over here. You know what I mean? We don't have laboratories sitting in the hood to take it from a raw leaf form into the paste, from the paste to the powder. So if you look the other way, when you know, crack is being pushed into the community in the volume that it was doing, it got to be conspiracy. What other word could it be? Complicity. The confusion between conspiracy and complicity allowed the CIA and the U.S. government to avoid responsibility, to evade responsibility for the contributions they made to the crack plague. Because what they were able to say was, we did not conspire to undermine black America. In fact, Deutsch himself, in the CIA's report, he admitted that the CIA was involved with known Contras who were running drugs, cocaine. But he started the report by saying, in our investigations, we found no evidence of conspiracy. After Gary Webb's story broke, then the CIA come down and investigate, you know, they come down and do their little interviews. And then I started to research and started to find out, you know, really what was going on. What it was was complicity. You know, when you, are, when you are a lookout and someone is in the store robbing 
The clerk? Yeah. If that person shoots the clerk, you just shot the clerk too. That's what complicity does. You commit the underlying crime. I walked in the courtroom. My auntie was there. My mom was there. He put up a big argument, and the judge, you know, listened a little bit. You know, his whole intentions was for me to make more money. The more money I made, the more money he made, and I guess the more money that uh, he would have to help sponsor the war. They wanted to just ignore the whole Blandone thing. So the jury had no choice. They found him guilty. They sentenced me first, and then because I had pled guilty, and then, like, OK. So I'm in this tank. 30 minutes later, 15 minutes later, Rick come in the tank. So Rick, we in the tank together. He said, damn, Cheek. I said, man, what happened? Man, they gave me life. My mom broke down in court, started crying, and, and you know, then you think to yourself that you just kill your mom. You know, basically that uh, you'll never see her as a free man again. So uh, that probably was the lowest point in my life that day. We're talking today, this is really a show about what we can call rumors. The rumor that the CIA was involved in making sure that cocaine made it to the streets of South Central LA back in the early 80s. When you think about it, we've been spending billions and billions and billions of dollars every year on this war on drugs. And to find out that the government, no matter what their role, you know, whether it was active or whether it was passive or what, was involved in some way in allowing drugs to come into the country, especially allowing drugs to come into black communities, um, that's a pretty explosive combination. Gary was a rebel. You know, Gary went against the system. He was the type of person that didn't want injustice to be taking place. We were on the Montel Williams show together, and he and I had the discussion where I said, right, Gary, you're making a mistake. Right now, what we're succumbing to is what Central Intelligence wants. We're making it a black issue. And it's not. And it's not. Fact is, CIA couldn't give a damn who it went to. My own daughter was a crack cocaine addict then, and I'm a white Jew. We had a lot of conversations about this. He said, you know, I, I, I didn't say that. And, he, and I said, you're absolutely right, but by keeping silent, you're acquiescing to it. And that's going to be your downfall. A surprising twist. The newspaper which had first published this astounding story started to back away from it. The media reaction at that point got pretty furious in saying that, well, we don't think it happened. Um, we don't think there's anything here. Gary was a fine reporter and had some fantastic instincts, but there were times where he wanted it both ways. I mean, I think he was careful to clarify things in moments, but I think he also participated in events and made comments that, that did tap into the popularization of some of his ideas. There's a lot of people who think that, you know, I made that whole thing up. What they don't realize is that the CIA admitted it. While some may choose not to believe findings that do not correspond to their, pre correspond to their preconceptions, we will present the unvarnished truth as we find it. Now Frederick Hitz comes out and, he's, and he admits that CIA was protecting drug dealers in Latin America and other places, but didn't have to report it because of an agreement with the Justice Department that they don't have to report these drug traffickers. The guy that's, you know, the mastermind is just as guilty as the guy on the street corner selling a dope. I mean, that's, and that's, to me, is the amazing part, is when you get a federal agency to admit that they were involved in drug trafficking and still nobody knows about it, um, there's something wrong with the media in this country. I thought that Gary took all the stuff that was happening to him with the media going against him and all the people jumping on him, he took that, I thought he took it as a challenge to prove now that all them was wrong and that he was right. He really, truly was starting to feel like his career was over. He was starting to struggle with, um, with depression. And once again, I think that started, truly started when he lost his job at the Mercury News. You 
there? Yeah. Did you hear the news? Uh-uh. Um, uh, Gary Webb supposedly killed himself. No. But, uh, of course, nobody thinks that it was suicide. You lying. No. Oh, man. When I first heard it, that he was dead, the first thing popped in my mind was the CIA got to him. You know, uh, suicide was definitely not something that I thought was possible. We know he kind of planned things for a while. We, we found clues to that, that he had planned the suicide. I do not believe Gary was killed. There's no reason to kill him. He was already nullified. That's when I wrote the article that was read at his funeral. Uh, it's called, Is Anybody Apologizing to Gary Webb? I wrote it right after Hitz's statement. So, you know, how come you guys aren't, you journalists aren't apologizing to the guy? I know that, that I probably contributed somewhat to his pain, and, and that's, that's one of the least proud parts of my career. I think history has shown that his instincts were, were sound, regardless of whatever you know, uh, mistakes were made along the way. Was CIA involved in drug trafficking? Legally, yes, they were. I mean, you go through so many phases when, 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 when you're doing this. I mean, you go through the phase that if I don't do it, somebody else will. You know, then you go through the phase, well, I don't want my girlfriend getting high. Don't you sell to her. I don't want my uncle getting high. I don't want my brothers getting high. I don't want my sisters getting high. I don't want my mom getting high. Then once these type of things start to affect you, and then you start to look, and you say, well, if I don't want my people getting high, how can I sell to his mother? Then once you start to ask yourself these type of questions, then you can start to make a change. But until you're being brought to your senses by something, you know, these things never really phase you. When we first got into business, I had no clue. I, I mean, like you said, it was fun. It was about making money. I had no clue the damage that it would cause to the black community, to yeah. our people, period. When I had my first child, the nurse came to me and she said, hey, do you smoke crack? And I said, no. And, and she said, does your wife smoke crack? And I said, no. But I knew when I looked at my wife and I saw those tears coming down her eyes, I can remember myself in there cooking this crap. And it flowing into my system, through my system, into my wife's system, and you birth a crack baby. She was born with her bladder hanging out of her stomach. She rid of my hand. She survived, and now, uh, you know, it's just 25 years later. She still has a scar that uh, reminds me the pain that I may have caused her because uh, we don't know if she can have a child. It is a true reality that it's gonna kill, the dope game will kill everything you love. It's a cold curse. Of course, when I was sitting there with that life sentence, I wish, oh man, you wish so, so hard that you never picked up drugs, that you never got yourself in this position. You know, uh, many, many times, many days, hours that I sit and I thought, and I walked the track and I was like, oh my goodness, how did I, how did I get myself into this? When I was in prison, all these crazy things was going through my head. How did you get here? What are you doing in prison? Why you can't read? See, I didn't know until I was sitting in prison how valuable an education was. For the first time in my life, I found myself wanting to know what was on a piece of paper. They gave me three pieces of paper. My lawyer had came to me one day and I'm like, what's going on, man? Why they want to give me a life sentence? He was like, well, Rick, everything you need to know is on these three pieces of paper. I was like, well, I ain't killed nobody. All I did was sold some drugs. See, he didn't know that I couldn't read. I didn't really know who I was. I had went broke. The government took everything from me. 
I started cleaning cells for $7 a cell. To me, it was a good job because I could do a cell in 15 minutes. I can do three, four cells in an hour. And when I used to clean the cells, everybody in the prison used to come over to see the drug kingpin clean cells. They thought it was, a, they got kicks out of it. See, I never felt that I should be in prison for the rest of my life. So what I did is I started to study. I had to go all the way back over and learn my ABCs. It was a prisoner that, that made me my cue cards and taught me how to sound out my ABCs. I had to go, I was 28 years old and I'm walking around in prison going, ah, put my card in my pocket. Bah, cuh. I read and I read and I read every day. Day in and day out for three or four years, I just read and studied, read and studied. And I saw my comprehension level going up and I saw, I started to read faster. And then it got fun to me. Then I started to say, well, wow, what was you ever afraid of? Why was you ever afraid to try to read? See, they used to laugh at me when I walk around with law books in my hand. And the dudes and homies on the compound would be like, homie, ain't nobody get out of here. When you get a life sentence, it's over. And then it came to me one day when I'm sitting there reading. I found these words. And they just popped out at me one day. Continuous criminal spree. Those are the words that set me free. That's the, those are the words why I'm standing here today. A continuous criminal spree is like what I did. They couldn't catch me, but they tried to three strike me. And when I went to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal, they agreed with me. They reversed me on that ground. And that's what allowed me to be here today and to be doing some of the things that I'm doing with my life right now. Me being here is, is like defying all odds. You know, people don't get federal life sentences and beat them. Oh, man. It seemed like this day would ever come. Finally, finally. You live in a, a box for 14 years. I don't even know what it's like yet. I'm still getting adjusted. <laughs> Mixed emotions. You want to leave, but you don't want to leave. You know, you got people that you, that you care about. What's up, Wayne? How are you? What's up, Doc? How are you, man? Yeah, yeah. I ain't forgot you, baby. What's good? It's all good. It's all good. How I feel to be out doing my fucking games. Like Superman. Unstoppable. What's up, man? What's up, Fit? As far as, like, the, like, with the Rick Ross guy is concerned, the other guy, you know, try to personate, use your name and everything like that, but... Ain't no question. Like, with me, I was looking at it like, I mean, it's an opportunity to, to, to really just, you know, have your, your story heard. Well, I'm wide open right now. You know, this, this is my first day out, so, uh, you know, I'm just trying to get, you know, it's been a long time. I made the name Rick Ross, and I'm gonna take it back. This man that stole this man's name? His identity theft. And a whole nother level, like they taking motherfuckers credit cards. The real Rick Ross ain't no rapper, ain't no figure to fall. He was a big time dope dealer. He was one of my best friends. And don't get it twisted. Appreciate it. Right, the real Ricky Ross, better known as Freeway Rick says William Roberts has made millions exploiting him. He's asking for $10 million in damages and half of the rapper's royalties. Well, boy, they better not get to no jury. If we get them to a jury, they gonna see. <laughs> let, the people, let the people make the call. They don't want that. The primary argument that ruled the day involved the statute of limitations. 
he would have been incarcerated during the period where she claimed that a lawsuit would have had to have been initiated. It's bullshit. I know you got your mom's house, you know. It isn't, it isn't a, the greatest decision. It was horrible. her house. She got caught up in that mortgage fraud stuff that went on. And, you know, this is what she wanted to spend her last days. Mom's 85 years old. She was hoping to spend the rest of her life right here. We got to get everything so everybody's here uh, getting it done. All right. All right. All right. All right. Bryce is still a baby, and when I leave, he has that little sense like, are oh, you gonna come back? You know, so, uh, you know, I owe him that to come back every time. You like to fly. <laughs> I spoke on Joe at my church. Joe was a man that was picked out to be picked on. Ricky was picked out to be picked on. He got a job to do. I'm not the least worried about him sending me back. Can't nothing stop it. Chills, you know, like, wow, you back in. First of all, I'm gonna let y'all know I'm a little nervous today because one of my worst nightmares that I ever had was to go back to prison. And when I walked through these doors, it kind of brought back that feeling that, that I had when I was locked up. But I took that time to better myself. One of the most important things is you have to become a critical thinker. A critical thinker is somebody that can take situations and analyze it. See, if the homies say they're getting into it, then we go and do it with them. We don't know what the consequences are going to be. We never sit down and say, well, what's going to happen if I do this? How is this going to affect me? Where am I going to end up? And just because you're in here, that don't make you no bad person. Because good people can make bad mistakes. What are you doing, big head? There's a saying that I always use, the champ is always the champ as long as he get up. You know, you, 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 you're a loser when you lay there. And, and, and even though I'm down, uh, uh, I'm gonna get up. I picked up a new trade and, and it's selling t-shirts. And it looks promising, you know, I got my own shop now. Was able to work my way in my shop. Really, that's, that, hey, that's real important to me. These are the shirts. Yeah, get busy, boy. You're going to be working. <laughs> I appreciate that. I just spoke to Danilo for the last five minutes. Unbelievable. You know, just had him on the phone. Alex got him on the phone. You know, I, um, um, he has said he will meet with me. Uh, but then he went off, you know, Rick is a liar, Rick is bad, don't believe a word he says, he's full of shit. I mean, it's just what he was just telling me. Danilo Blando. I hate that he feel that way about me because I don't feel that same way about him. 
questions that I would like to ask him, man, why, 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 why would you do your friend, you know? What was it like testifying, you know, knowing that your friend was gonna get a life sentence, somebody that had done so much for you and had so much love and respect and admiration for you? It was like he pointed a gun at me and shot the gun. I mean, you know, you missed. Luckily, <laughs> I got a second chance. I'm gonna do it. <laughs> I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna stay here at 12 o'clock at night. I'm gonna get here early in the morning, and I'm gonna get mine together. It's my man there. That's my man there. Put my cold hands on your plate. 